All right, the webinar is now live. Hold on just a second, everybody. Um, we're just going to wait for our participants to come in, and then we will get started today. All right, we'll go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. My name is Katie Shelley, and I am a disability rights advocate here at the Ability Center. I would like to welcome you to the fourth and final of our sessions um, for the fourth annual ADA seminar. Um, and this session is going to be on healthcare equity. The ADA seminar came about as a way for us at the Ability Center to connect with ADA coordinators in our area and help educate them on what is required under the Americans with Disabilities Act. If you would like to be part of our ADA coordinator network and are not already, don't hesitate to reach out to me at kshelley at abilitycenter.org and I will make sure you are added to our listserv. I send out a blog post on ADA related themes every couple of months and keep ADA coordinators up to date on trainings provided. I am also more than happy to meet one-on-one -on -one with local jurisdictions in order to provide technical assistance on the ADA. Just some housekeeping items before we get started. If, reminder that if you are registered to attend all four sessions and you attend all four sessions, you will be entered to win a grab bag with Ability Center swag, and that includes a Toledo is for Everyone t-shirt. Today, we have a panel on healthcare equity during COVID-19, where representatives from the Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio will discuss their collaboration with the Ability Center on the revision of the guidelines for resource allocation for people with disabilities in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The host of this panel will be our Director of Advocacy and Disability Rights Attorney here at the Ability Center, Katie Hunt Thomas. Katie Hunt Thomas is the Disability Rights Attorney and Director of Advocacy for the Ability Center of Greater Toledo. The Ability Center is a center for independent living that serves seven counties in Northwest Ohio. Katie received her Bachelor of Arts, magna cum laude, from Xavier University and her Juris Doctorate, cum laude, from the University of Toledo College of Law. Please help me welcome Katie Hunt Thomas. Thank you, Katie. Uh, every year, the Ability Center gives a Community Partnership Award to an organization that has shown true dedication to making Northwest Ohio the most disability-friendly region in the country. This year, as the COVID-19 pandemic unfolded, disability rights activists around the country brought national attention to the discriminatory nature of many state Department of Health's allocation of state scarce resource guidelines. But here in Northwest Ohio, the Hospital Association of Northwest Ohio showed leadership by not only ahead of the curve reevaluating their guidance on scarce allocation of resources in light of the COVID-19 pandemic, but also in inviting the Ability Center into the process to ensure that the final document met what was ever evolving non-discriminatory standards. Um, our final allocation of scarce resources document meets national best practices and equitable treatment of people with disabilities and is, I believe, something that our region can be proud of um, to have adopted as guidance for our regional hospitals. To accept this award, HCNO has put together a, vi a video featuring Jan Ruma, who is the Vice President of HCNO, and after the video, we'll have a panel of represent representatives from the committee that drafted the document. Thanks, HCNO, for all your hard work on this project. I'm Jan Ruma, and I serve as the Vice President of the Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio. On behalf of our member hospitals, I am honored to accept the Ability Center's 2020 Community Partnership Award. 
The Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio has worked with the Ability Center over the years to advocate and address a variety of community health issues, from access to health care and transportation to disaster preparedness. When the COVID-19 pandemic hit, updated health care allocation of scarce resources guidance was needed, and a regional task force was formed. The Ability Center was asked to appoint a representative to help assure that the allocation of scarce resource guidance developed would be non-discriminatory and create a meaningful access for all patients. The Ability Center appointed their disability rights attorney and director of advocacy, Katherine Hunt Thomas, and she has served as a key resource in developing guidance to help healthcare providers objectively allocate medical resources if there are any shortages during the COVID-19 pandemic or other emergencies. She serves along with physicians, attorneys, ethicists, patient advocates, nurses, and other professionals from across the region. This collaborative effort develop guidance to ensure everyone receives the best possible care and that any patient care decisions faced by Northwest Ohio healthcare providers are fair and non-discriminatory. The guidance developed by this voluntary task force of experts will assist Northwest Ohio hospitals in furthering their own internal policies and procedures. I am honored to accept this award on behalf of the Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio and the task force members who are sharing their time and expertise to provide guidance that will help us all in times of crisis. Thank you. So congratulations again to HCNO on accepting our Community Partnership Award and on this project. Um, now we'd like to pivot and go and speak some of the panelists um, that were on a committee to create the scarce allocation um, of resource guidelines. Um, we have uh, four panelists and one of the things I was struck by when we were invited to this project was just how broad a representation there was from area hospitals and from um, different specialties um, in, in, um, in our medical system here in Northwest Ohio. So to begin, I'd like to go through and just ask each of the panelists uh, to please introduce yourself, the organization you work for, and describe how you came to work on the panel. Um, uh, just for a little bit of guidance, I would say, uh, Dr. Rega, why don't you go first? Okay, uh, good, uh, good morning, everybody. Um, my name is Paul Rega. I am a physician, uh, emergency physician, practicing clinically for 34 years. Uh, then I retired, and for the past 10 years or 11 years, I've been an uh, assistant professor at the University of Toledo, uh, teaching a number of courses that I created, including pandemic preparedness and response. Um, how I got involved with this is because uh, I've been involved in it tangentially, uh, actually for the past 10 years, with other individuals regarding allocation of scarce resources. Uh, so I was asked to be involved with this particular uh, endeavor. Uh, and for those who don't see me as well as you would like, uh, I'm a very mature individual uh, with a lot of wavy white hair on top of my head. <laughs> I'm only kidding. <laughs> right. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Otis? Hi, thank you, Katie. Um, yes, I'm. Uh, my name is Pam Otis. I am a pediatrician by training and I work at Mercy St. Vincent here in Toledo. I do uh, some pediatrics, uh, outpatient pediatrics has always been my love. Uh, and I also chair our ethics committee here at St. Vincent, serve on the regional committee as well. And I also chair our institutional review board, which reviews all research on human subjects. We are charged with keeping human subjects safe um, and that we have sound research that we are engaging in. And I um, am also a mature individual. I've, I've been practicing for um, 35 years and um, have the same white wavy hair that Paul does um, on my head and I have round glasses. Mm -hmm. All right, um, Valerie Hublet. Thank you very much, and we certainly appreciate that award. I'm Valerie Hovland with the Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio, and I'm the Director of Compliance and Operations. And um, for those of you who may not be able to see me, 
I am a middle-aged, uh, dark brown, long hair, and I also have glasses. So a lot of us have glasses today. Um, mm -hmm. I was lucky enough to um, be chosen and trusted by our Vice President Jan Ruma uh, to be on this task force. And my legal background lends itself to some advocacy uh, for disabled um, individuals and children. So it was even a, a, a better uh, fit for me. And um, I initially uh, was on the periphery of the, for the, um, our HMAC, um, they're going to hear a lot of acronyms probably today. And the HMAC is, was the Northwest Ohio Healthcare Multi-Agency uh, Coordination System. And I was helping them with federal guidance, legal guidance, compliance. And uh, then we did the task force and I was lucky enough to be chosen. And I appreciate the fact that HCNO trusted me to be on this so we could be with all of these excellent people. If you look at the, the list of who's on it, um, it looks like a who's who from Northwest Ohio. Uh, thank you, Valerie. And then um, the last panelist that we're going to introduce is Dr. Uh, Bruce Barnett. Well, thank you for uh, having me participate in this. My name is Bruce Barnett. I'm a, a practicing physician. I um, am a pediatrician and a lung specialist and an intensive care doctor. Uh, I practiced in Toledo for I hate to say it, uh, 40 years. Um, I'm the Vice President of Medical Affairs at uh, ProMedica Ebi Children's Hospital. I'm also a professor in the College of Medicine at the University of Toledo, and I'm the Medical Director of the Cystic Fibrosis Center. So um, it's with great pleasure that I was invited, uh, I think primarily by uh, Dr. Otis and Dr. Rega. Um, I've known them uh, as, uh, friends and partners in crime for many years. Um, I also am a, I'm not mature, so I'm gonna call myself a seasoned citizen. Um, I have lots of uh, gray hair and I'm a little short and a little chubby. Uh, and um, I wear glasses also. I think you have to be a glasses wearer, except for Paul, to be on this uh, panel. So I'm right here. I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm happy to be a part and help. Oh, Paul's got his glasses. He's just not wearing them. Uh, I'm happy to be a part and uh, I'm uh, glad to have, I think, offered maybe at least a little bit of expertise to this group. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Thanks for being here. And again, um, you know, thanks for working so hard um, to ensure that these guidelines um, had input from, uh, from the disability community. Um, the next question uh, um, has to do with um, the goals and how to engage in the project. I think uh, we probably have a wide variety of audience members who maybe aren't sure um, of the history or um, exactly the, um, the uh, purpose of creating a document like this. Um, so this question is for Valerie Hubland and Dr. Rega. Um, can you describe a little bit more about HCNO, how it made the decision to engage in the project, and then what the goals were? And um, we can start with Dr. Rega. Yeah, actually, I, I will defer to uh, Valerie about the uh, HCNO project, and I can get into the history of the allocation and the problems that arose uh, in the beginnings of the 21st century. So Valerie, I defer to you to, to give a little background from the HCNO for, uh, viewpoint. Sure, I can do that. Um, as Jan said in the video, um, ACNO is a member-driven regional hospital association, and um, we represent an advocate, advocate on behalf of our members and the health systems and the hospitals in, in Northwest Ohio. And, um, and one of those featured divisions that we have, we have seven divisions, and many of you may know the Northwest Ohio Pathways Hub. Um, we administer and um, we staff the CareNet, um, Northwest Ohio CareNet, and we also have health assessments. And so we have very, very, um, a very division group. And so what we also have is disaster preparedness. And disaster preparedness uh, represents 32 hospitals in 18 counties. And so that's where we came up with um, all of when, when COVID-19 hit, 
um, our disaster preparedness group became a command center. And so we brought Dr. Riga in and a group of experts that could help us um, in this pandemic. As everybody knows, it, it, it really hit quickly and it hit, it hit fast um, in, in our region. And we were talking about, you know, what happens if there was an absolute deficit of some resource, whether it was uh, people, whether it was ventilators, um, you know, ventilators do get a, a lion's share of the, I think, media exposure, but it could be PPE, it could be staffing, it could be beds. And so that was why this task force came about. And um, the Hospital Council of Northwest Ohio, we are the regional health coalition that brought that about. And um, Dr. Riga can talk more about HMAC and um, his experience with the uh, the way he came about in, in this process. Um, yeah, thank you, Valerie. Uh, well, essentially, um, you know, as, as many of you already know, we've had pandemics in the 20th century, uh, the divorce one being 1918, where we had about 2 million dead in this country, uh, but maybe 30 or 40 million dead around the world. Uh, so um, where the key was, where that really, really um, intrigued me was what happened when they had the SARS uh, uh, coronavirus number one in Toronto because people realized that they may not have enough resources or personnel to take care of the possibility of having thousands of people coming down with this novel coronavirus. Uh, and, and papers got written about this. Uh, they realized that people were stressed out. They realized that people were not getting the care that they were anticipating simply because they were not the resources available. So papers were written about that. Uh, ethicists got in, involved with this, uh, deciding who should get a resource, who should not get a resource, what criteria you would require uh, to obtain that kind of resource and things of that sort. So it was essentially a matter of looking at the resources, looking at the ethics behind it, which is the, which is the key thing, the ethical framework. And, and then using that ethical framework as a basis for making decisions. Uh, fortunately, on top of the ethical framework, uh, we also had the ability of having a uh, federal law uh, that also provides us uh, some guidance. So in terms of the HMAC, uh, what was created through HMAC was the fact that we, uh, using the legal system, uh, using the ethical framework that, uh, that we incorporated, uh, we were able to develop a, a, re a regular frame around a painting um, and then paint that painting with a bunch of initial brush strokes uh, with the idea essentially now of having the hospitals now fill that in to fit their particular needs. Uh, and so that was the whole point behind this. We really, really stressed the idea that everybody uh, is equal and that we are not discriminating against anybody particular, uh, regardless of race, color, creed, et cetera, or comorbidities or anything of that sort, that we have a guidance document that allows the healthcare professional uh, to uh, attend to these people uh, ethically and legally. Great, I think that was a great um, background and um uh, description of, of uh, you know, why, why it was important to engage in this process. Um, I think we also wanted to get to, um, you know, what was the process, um, who was involved, how was that put together. I know I was impressed by um, just how many people were involved in giving input and ensuring that um, the document covered what it needed to. Um, so the, this question is for uh, Dr. Barnett and Dr. Otis. Um, what is the what was the process for creating the document, and you know who was involved? Um, Thank you, Dr. Otis. Would you? Yeah. Oh, yeah. sure, sure, Katie. Thanks. Okay. Um, <laughs> Would you want to go first? <laughs> sure. Um, yeah, the process was fascinating, um, and I was asked to serve by our CEO. I think because of the combination of my medical background and my work in ethics um, and research um, in the region, um, Northwest Ohio. So I was really honored um, and I will say somewhat taken aback um, at the thought of developing um, this document that was really about allocation of scarce resources. Now my career as a physician had been about serving and providing resources and the the whole question of not having enough resources 
had never been a part of what I did as a pediatrician. So this experience of developing a, um, a regional policy was fascinating. Um, and uh, Paul Riga came with a, quite a detailed document that was extensive um, and well-researched, um, well-referenced. So we started by reading that, and I read lots of other articles um, that um, were annotated in that document. Um, and I learned a lot. I contributed as much as I could, and I learned a lot from colleagues um, in, uh, in emergency medicine, internal medicine, surgery, um, uh, administrators, other ethicists, um, we, in nursing. We had rural um, input. We had urban input. It was, it was really a very broad-based group, and I learned a tremendous amount from uh, you, Katie, and from Valerie about um, uh, the law and what we could and what we couldn't do, um, and how we had to, how we had to address those issues. Um, it was fascinating, and. Uh, and I think for us in Northwest Ohio, the hospital council is a unifying um, group. And um, to have all of the hospitals um, working so closely together and collaboratively and transparently was, uh, was delightful. It was refreshing. It was a relief and a joy. And, uh, um, and we learned, um, I will say that our mercy policy, our Bonsacor Mercy, our whole organizational policy, we have a new draft. Um, and that new draft um, is coming. Uh, there's a lot of information from what we learned in our, and other people in the country learned um, from our process. So um, yeah, that was, that was what we did. We had meetings, we talked on the phone, we read and we learned from each other. Excellent. And uh, Dr. Dr. Barnett, what would you wanna say, and you know, um, contribute about the process and how things were developed? Well, I think um, it's tough to follow those two, number one, because they hit most of the high points. Well, I had a few things that I think um, we should be aware of. Number one is, is that, as with most things in medicine, uh, a lot of the policy was originally developed uh, looking at our adult population. Um, we in pediatrics always um, worry that we're the Johnny come lately to the, to the party. Uh, we were worried um, with some of these um, concerns about PPE or ventilators or whatever our concerns were, uh, that all of them would be given to adult patients. Uh, we have been um, advocates for our kids for a long time in our careers. Um, and so we were really very interested to see how the original um, suggestions and the original protocol that, that was developed how it would affect our kids. And then even we dove into it even deeper, not only just pediatrics in general, uh, but the sickest of our newborn babies uh, and um, the sickest of our teenagers. So we tried to cover from actual birth uh, to age 21 in the pediatric population. A lot of the things that we were concerned about uh, being scarce, um, particularly because of the New York experience in the beginning. Um, and then uh, we wanted to use um, systems of evaluation that crossed over not only in the adult population, but also in the pediatric population. So we could compare need as in the expression goes, apples to apples and oranges to oranges. So we tried to, to do um, as best we could. This is a very broad um, and scary topic. I agree with uh, Dr. Otis's concern, the fact uh, that we've never in our careers had to say, okay, well, there's only one ventilator and you have four patients who need it. Now, what are you gonna do? We've never thought like that. That's not the way we are trained to think, uh, nor has it been with IVs or antibiotics. The other concern is, is that the hospital council represents uh, all kinds of hospitals uh, in the greater Toledo area. Um, each hospital has its own personality. Each hospital has its weaknesses and strengths. Uh, and um, we wanted to be able to make sure that kids would get care that was appropriate for them and the best that we could do across every hospital and healthcare 
uh, provider in our greater region. So it was an, it's a daunting task. And then the other comment I'll make before I um, have said already too much is the fact that um, this is um, a live project or a growing project or whatever term we want to use. Um, but as we hopefully never get into a situation where we have to allocate the scarce resources, but if we do, we'll learn that the, the piece of paper that we spent months and months putting together uh, has its weaknesses and strengths and we'll have to go back to the drafting table, so to speak, and redo parts of it. So um, no matter how good you think it is, I'm sure we've made mistakes along the way and, and hopefully we'll never find out what some of those mistakes are. Thank you. Um, I think something else that people watching this webinar are probably looking for a little bit more information on is um, how disability ended up being a factor in the decision making and how that was included um, as part of uh, part of the discussions. So um, this question is for Valerie Hovland and for Dr. Rega. Um, how is disability a factor um, in the decision making? And um, who would like to go first this time? I, I can go first, if you don't mind, Dr. Rega. No <laughs> Um, there, we, we had a framework and as Dr. Riga said, we had an ethical framework. That was one of the first things that we started with and it had to do with the intent was to create meaningful access to these scarce resources for everybody without excluding people based on disabilities. And so that's when we knew that we needed the Ability Center and you, Katie, involved. Um, I guess the other thing that I would say, we wanted it to be based on objective medical evidence rather than stereotypes or unfair judgments um, for people with disabilities. So that was the, the ethical uh, framework. Also, as you well know, we had the legal framework and um, we started out with four attorneys and, um, and then had three for the second uh, addendum. And what we did with that was we looked at, obviously, the OCR had already written in March a letter uh, saying that people with disabilities should be protected and that they wanted to make sure that, that their advocacy was brought forward. In addition to the fact that there was a letter to Congress by the Consortium for Citizens of Disabilities, and they, this was all going on in March. And um, the ADA in Section 504 also have provisions in it that say you can't say that somebody is disabled doesn't have just as much quality of life or just as much prospect for viability and survival. So that was what we used. The law was there and we had the ethics on our side. When we started this, I think, Katie, you'll remember, only Alabama had, some states have official uh, allocation of scarce resource documents. Ohio does not. But Alabama was basically uh, slapped on the wrist and they had to go back and redo theirs because they had some discriminatory uh, terms and, and unethical things in their document. And what happened towards the end in September, we had Alabama, Pennsylvania, Tennessee, and Utah all had uh, been slapped on the wrist and had to redo their allocation of scarce resource documents. So that's why it was so important, both legally and ethically, that um, the disability community be involved and have a say. Um, yeah, uh, and as to, my, to my point of view about all this is that um, prior to this past year, um, much of what was written in, in some of the states, not all the states, in fact, only a minority of the states, uh, they had their guidelines and their protocols. Uh, but the idea was, was that this was not well uh, 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 sent out to the rest of the population in the United States, uh, let alone the healthcare system. And so the concern I always had was that, God forbid, there should be something bad like a pandemic or a nuclear holocaust, uh, that um, decisions as far as triage goes, as far as allocation of scarce resources would go, would be an arbitrary decision based on the uh, healthcare provider at the moment. Uh, and, and really, if you looked at into any, some of the details, uh, some of that was already going on during Hurricane Katrina. People were making decisions based on uh, people's individual presentations and disabilities was brought into that to begin with. Uh, so um, you, there's, a, there's a caution light about that. Uh, fortunately, uh, with the ethical framework and with the, the legal 
system behind us, we're able to take that and now uh, protect uh, those who need as much protection as possible. Uh, and then this gives the average healthcare provider uh, something to work with. Uh, so, um, uh, and this really, in terms of, of what we've been doing uh, with COVID-19, uh, is something that has not really been thought of nationally uh, around the, you know, um, before that. And this has been something that has been on, uh, as far as public health is concerned, this has been on their radar ever since uh, SARS and even before SARS uh, in Toronto. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of that information or a lot of those pleas uh, to improve the resources like PPE and ventilator uh, procurement and development, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, was kind of like pushed aside because it was not a necessity at the moment. Uh, and now we find ourselves in this kind of situation where we had to play catch up. Uh, but fortunately, uh, people did pre you know, uh, uh, started. Uh, the ball rolling, and we were able to build on that. And I, I echo Dr. Barnett saying that this is not a final document. It is an evolving document. Uh, so that as new things come, uh, come by the boards, that uh, uh, we will adapt to that. Uh, and we also serve, this committee also serves as a resource for all the hospitals in the region, uh, should they have questions, uh, that they can access us, uh, this body of, quote, experts, uh, to help them work through that. And, and thank you for that. Um, and again, we appreciate you know being involved uh, to ensure that that framework was in place and that we were able to give input on that. Um, so the next question um, for those who are not familiar with um, with everything we worked on, there were two documents. The first applied to adults, and then the second was an addendum that was um, for pediatrics. I have to say, I learned quite a bit about pediatrics um, during this process. Um, and I'm sure that um, people would be interested in knowing a kind of the, how the um, drafting of the documents differed you know, between adults and between kids. Um, so um, this question is for both of the doctors who work in pediatrics on the committee. Um, how, how was this process applied to pediatrics? Um, how was it different um, from developing the adult um, scarce allocation of resources document. This question is for Dr. Barnett and Dr. Otis. Um, Dr. Barnett, would you want to go first um, on this one? Sure. Um, I'm glad to help. Number one is, is that uh, we had the distinct advantage of having a framework uh, that we were able to work off of. So what we wanted these two documents to be, the adult document, and the pediatric document is we wanted them to be very similar. We didn't want uh, the adult document to say, the only thing that you can do is A, and we didn't want the pediatric document to say, the only thing you can do is Z. So we wanted them to be very similar uh, in the layout of the document and in um, the basic principles of the document. So that was number one. So a lot of that had already been done uh, we spent some time reviewing the adult document and making sure it was where we wanted it to be. And then we went from there. So that was point number one. Point number two is, is that unlike uh, adult medicine, um, the, there are significant differences in levels of care uh, in different hospitals in greater Toledo. And um, the hospitals who have certain expertises, I'm not sure that's correct as plural expertises, but different kinds of expertise, um, cooperate and share and help other hospitals. So we wanted um, those um, areas of expertise uh, to help put this document together. We also realized that if there was truly a pandemic and we had uh, children, more children who needed to be in a pediatric intensive care unit because bed supply or bed allocation uh, is certainly one of the areas where you could have shortages. Uh, we wanted to make sure that children who were in other hospitals who didn't routinely have a pediatric intensive care unit or a neonatal intensive care unit, uh, those uh, locations would be able to borrow some um, personnel, borrow some particular equipment, or borrow expertise uh, 
uh, from subspecialty providers that every single hospital in our region doesn't have. So the concept was is that um, to provide a way to give the very best possible care and do it in a way that was just and fair and equal to everybody and then realize that at a certain point, if it got really bad, that we might be competing against adult patients for the same equipment. So we needed to have a way to judge who needed it the most comparing pediatric patients to adult patients. So um, it's a tremendous amount of work that was done uh, and um, we didn't always agree in the beginning and then we did a lot of cajoling, talking um, uh, and explaining. Uh, we had um, both healthcare uh, providers, ethicists uh, and um, lawyers, of course, uh, and uh, people who were uh, um, ministers. So I think there was a huge wealth of knowledge from various different areas of expertise that all kind of got together. So um, Pam, I'm sure I forgot about 30 things. So please fill in the holes. Um, well, I, the whole function and our presentation as a panel is such a lovely metaphor for what we did on our weekly telephone calls for months. I just want to say that this started in March and we did not finish the pediatric um, addendum Calling it an addendum seems diminutive, and it was not diminutive at all. Um, I don't know, until September. So we've been at this for a very long time, and um, the level of collegiality and humor, and I will say lovely, healthy disagreement was terrific. Um, it was really an example of putting knowledgeable, opinionated people together um, who spoke their minds and also listened. Um, I think we were able to speak our minds and hear each other and move and really did come to um, an amazing consensus. And I'm surprised you didn't say this, Bruce, but um, because I hear your words ringing in my head and I love them, is that children are not little adults. Um, and I think that came through over and over and over again um, as we were working on the pediatric, pediatric addendum. And children are not all children. I mean, we have neonates. We have premature neonates. We have neonates with genetic issues. We have healthy neonates. Um, we have mothers that could be affected um, by whatever the disaster is, whether it's COVID or nuclear or something else. Um, so we had neonatologists um, that came on our calls and gave us their rigorous expertise um, that informed that section. We had pediatric intensivists who were very involved with their, with their expertise from their own particular hospital. And we also, we also leaned on and got information from regional, much bigger regional centers um, to learn and then we, but we had to make our own decisions um, for what's going to work for our um, section of Northwest Ohio. Uh, and I think having rural, um, the input from some rural primary care physicians and um, nursing, uh, both nursing from our big, our big hospital centers here in Toledo, as well as from rural areas um, gave us a, a broad understanding of what was needed from people who were going to take care of children in their, in their hospitals or had to figure out who was going to get transported and what, how, did we, how did we set that up and not transport people that shouldn't be transported and those, the levels of communication um, that were going to need to be there. And, and I, I do want to also say that Paul, Paul's leadership on both of these, um, on both of these endeavors, was remarkable. the The materials that he brought to us to the to start off both of these um, were thorough, detailed, um, comprehensive, and he was not the least bit defensive of no, no, we've got to keep this or we can't keep that. He was there to facilitate a process of transparency, um, arguing, listening, and efficiency. 
he was not into having this take three years. Um, it needed to get finished. So it was a great, it was a great leadership of, um, of both expediency and um, taking the time we needed to have us all be um, together with consensus. So, yeah, and we did it. Excellent. That was really interesting um, to see that come together. Um, so we actually have just one more question, and it's for all panelists. Um, so I, I know we wanted to, this is such a complicated issue, and it was such a complicated process, and we wanted to let each of you kind of give some closing, um, you know, some closing remarks about what you would want um, people who are interested in knowing more to learn. Um, so the final question is, um, what final thoughts would you want to leave for people interested in knowing more about the issue? And I think um, I'm just going across sort of who I can see first in my Zoom panel. So uh, we're going to start with Valerie um, uh, to give an answer. Well, and, and I think what we would want our region to know is that, you know, there, there were other documents and, and we could have gone with other documents and looked at them, but we wanted something that brought people from our region together and that we crafted it together as, as Pam explained. And so that was why we did it um, so that Northwest Ohio, the region would have its own um, document and it was created and crafted. And, you know, there may be hospitals that already have their own um, guidance, but this was guidance in case other people didn't need it or, you know, like Pam said, they might want to change it. And I think it's a living, breathing document. Um, you know, what we want to do from here on is we're going to probably have another task force. We assume we will. And this time we will not just be bringing in medical people. Um, we also had the, the YWCA to make sure that the underserved were were also had a voice in these documents. And so that was important to us also. But, you know, when we have the next task force or this task force that we can go back and say, hey, there have been other cases. You and I have already talked about, Katie, that we may go back and look at some of the parts that we had to make sure that these that what we're doing is in line with the law as it's coming out. As many of us know, with COVID, it's it's crazy. Things come out every day, letters, cases, um, things that we aren't the, the numbers go up and down. So our documents have to be fluid and so do the people. But this is truly a regional document done by regional people. And uh, the hospital council was, was very glad and fortunate to be able to bring all of these people together as the liaison. Um, and Dr. Burnett, you're, you're next in my little Zoom panel. Do you wanna go next? Well, I think um, number one is I would say that uh, as everybody has said, this is a start. Uh, we need to continue this work. I don't know at what point in time we um, look towards calling everybody back together and saying, okay, it's been three months or six months. Uh, luckily, we haven't needed to say we're down to the last three ventilators in Northwest Ohio. Who gets them? But what have we already experienced that would suggest that this particular part that we did wasn't as good as it should be or needs to be reconfigured? I think we have new questions clearly on the horizon. Um, hope is, is that sometime in the near future um, that we will have some immunization uh, that will give some protective value for that. Uh, how do we order uh, or how do we put in groups uh, the order in which people will be offered that immunization? That's a huge question moving forward. Uh, we have new therapies from Dissevere and different kinds of uh, IV steroids that are being used. Um, they're not readily available for the entire population. How do we dispense them in a, in a very logical and fair way? Um, so um, it's kind of like we, we looked over the hill, we saw a little tiny piece of cheeseburger, we ate it, but there's a lot more cheeseburgers that need to be eaten on the way to wherever we're going. So I think it's just truly the beginning of our work um, the problem is, as uh, everyone here would tell you, is, is that we all do 87 different things. Uh, and um, 
as important as this work is, we seem like we never have enough time to do what we're already doing. So um, we need more peeps uh, to participate moving forward. Thank you. Um, Dr. Otis? Uh, thank you. Um, I do wanna add that I have on a multicolored necklace that I forgot to say in my appearance, um, sort of sparkly large balls. Um, <clears throat> I too uh, am very aware of the fact that this document um, reached a point in time and we have lived with COVID for another number of months. Um, and again, the specter of other disasters, this is not just related to COVID, although it certainly was the, what lit the fire for us to do this. Um, and I do look forward to revisiting because I think that um, organizationally, um, we have fresh perspectives and that our region matters as a geography um, and that how we cooperate with each other, which was tremendous in our, in our initial work, um, will be reflected in how we care for our citizens in this community. And um, our level of transparency and cooperation is, uh, is really important as hospital systems um, and counties and health departments. So I actually look forward to revisiting our document with a fresh mind. Um, and again, hopefully we won't ever need it, but I would like it to be as, in as good a shape as it can be um, if and when we do need it um, anytime in the near future. Thanks. Great. And Dr. Rega, uh, closing remarks and next steps um, for the committee and for the document. Uh, my closing remarks, basically, number one is uh, I'm, I'm grateful to the Hospital Council uh, and also to you, Katie, um, for uh, being part of this thing and having Hospital Council developing this team of, of experts uh, who really work collegial. Uh, and it's like you wish Congress would be as collegial <laughs> as we were during this whole <laughs> <laughs> uh, having said that, uh, that's the only pol political thing I'm going to make, but having said that, um, I, the big thing that I want to convey, um, if it can be conveyed to the world, at least here in Northwest Ohio, uh, there is the desire uh, to tell people that regardless of who you are, what you are, what disabilities you have, what color skin you have, what religion you may uh, uh, have, uh, that we are all equal. Uh, in, in this in this situation, and that whatever decisions are going to be made, they're going to be made ethically and legally, um, and it's going to be based on uh, clinical factors at that moment, uh, so that people are, should not be afraid of seeking help uh, and think that they're going to be pushed aside. That is exactly why we're having meetings like this or teleconferences, so that people understand that we feel for them and that we want to um, assure them that uh, the healthcare system will work for them. That's all I got to say. Wonderful. Um, so we have about 10 minutes left um, of, our, of our time that we reserve for questions. So I would invite anybody listening um, to put some questions um, in the Q&A. Uh, if you are able to identify who the question is for, um, you know, that would be helpful, I think, for people responding. Um, if not, you know, people can speak up. Um, um, and then um, our disability, uh, disability advocate, Jimmy Russell from uh, the Ability Center is gonna be handling and um, ensuring those get asked. So um, if we have any questions, Jimmy. Yeah, so um, someone did ask, this seems more like a general group question. Um, they wondered if there is, would be possible or if anyone would be interested in having more follow-up discussions periodically uh, to keep the Lucas County Board of Developmental Disabilities staff and providers informed about disaster preparedness, obtaining and distributing PPE, emergency meds, evacuation plans, COVID-19 inoculation prioritization, et cetera. Do you guys have any way of distributing, I guess, more information about that? Or do you have any handouts or anything from your professional life, I guess, would be a better way of framing this to, that we could pass along to the participants today? If not, that's, you know, fine too. <laughs> sure, sure, we can do that. 
Just, I, I don't, I'm, how would we get it to them? Just let us know how to get it to them and we can definitely give a better description of what we've done and um, how uh, we got the word out and, and what our, our guidelines contain, our guidance contains. And, and Dr. Riga can probably um, teach an entire class on this because I believe that he teaches at the <laughs> University of Toledo and he's probably taught this in his classes about the pandemic. I have a class uh, five hours from now just on this particular um, topic, pandemic preparedness and response. Uh, and it looks like um, it looks like the question came from someone who works for Lucas County Board of DD. So maybe we could follow up with them to do a little bit more in detail discussion about what's available. Um, sure. And that's the thing. Uh, let's see, we should have her. Um, her contact information from the from the signing up for the seminar, so we can reach out to that person as well. Some of her said that emails or handouts or Zoom or whatever would be great. She responded in the question box. So okay, great. Uh, so I, yeah, I, I, I just wanted to say some of her question was quite clinical, like availability of remdesivir. I mean, so that. Um, and Paul, I would imagine you're aware of who's doing what trials um, and what, I mean, and those things change. I mean, what's available for emergency use. Um, but those are some of the things she asked about are gonna be hospital-based, not for uh, you know, community distribution. So I think you can address all that, I would think. Yeah, um, and I gotta tell you, as far as the remdesivir situation goes, that, seems to, that seemed to have bypassed um, our level and went right to the hospitals and and that had to be from it seemed like from physician to whoever was dispensing the remdesivir but just as an aside uh, people may want to know that uh, this group plus other individuals other experts will be meeting now with regards to the allocation of scarce resources namely uh, the vaccine uh, the COVID-19 vaccine that's coming down the pike sometime in our future uh, there has been a document that has been promulgated now from the uh, from a totally apolitical board of experts uh, that we have received or the nation has received, and we are looking at that and we'll be looking at that and uh, making it more granular for the needs of our community, uh, and that will include the people um, who are on this um, in this in this audience. Great, and uh, there was another question that came in. Uh, the question is, do, they, do you have any insight about vaccines and who would be the first to get the vaccines? And I think that was to be generally addressed to the group. Okay, um, I, let, let, me, let, let me just take that. Um, uh, yes, we have an insight about that. Um, it's broken up in the different phases. This is coming from that apolitical body of experts that were, con uh, that were convened from, I believe it was the CDC and NIH. Uh, and they put together this document in a matter of a couple of months or so. Uh, and and they're, they're, what they're, this is interim now, uh, but they've broken it up as far as who gets their vaccines uh, in uh, phase one, phase two, phase three, and phase four. Uh, and right now they're looking at phase one and they're separating that into phase 1A and phase 1B with regards to healthcare providers, uh, people who are living in congregate care or working in congregate care, morticians, EMS, uh, nursing home staff. Uh, and so our role in this kind of endeavor would be to seeing how do we uh, break that down even further so that when we get those vaccines, uh, who will get it first among the um, that people in the first phase. Then there's phase two, which will include people like educators, uh, phase three for the more of the general public, and phase four. And it's all based on the uh, how much vaccine is going to be coming our way. Uh, we, but there are a lot, of, uh, a lot of unknowns. We don't know exactly to whom it's going. We don't know exactly uh, who will be distributing it, uh, how it's going to be distributed, who's going to be doing the vaccinations. Uh, how is the vaccine going to be stored? Where is it going to be stored? Uh, there's a lot of stuff that's still unknown. So we have to work through that whole particular process. And people weigh in on you know, what, what you know about it. That's about the best I can tell you. That's great. Um, this is more of a general question for the group. 
Uh, it says, this person says they're interested in following the group and your work in progress. What is the best way for them to do so? Um, I'm not sure Valerie, which group they're talking about. Is that something that you're able to answer? Well, our, as, as Dr. Riga said, he just, he just described the pathways that we are being told today of what the, the vaccine might be. And we're reconvening the task force to talk about how hospitals um, within their staffing and nursing homes um, might have uh, a better handle on how they're going to distribute the vaccine with their staff since they are going to be part of the first group that, that will get it. Uh, and so uh, we'll probably do uh, another something like this or, or uh, a press release when that occurs. But this time the task force is going to have frontliners on there, um, people that are first responders, the, the clinicians that we have, legal. Uh, and so it's going to be pretty exciting um, to have all of those groups together to be talking about that. So I, I guess I, I would think a press release would go out. Um, once um, we have an HMAC CEO group and they are the ones that approve the, the final document when we get it after it goes through the regular HMAC. And so um, I would say stay tuned and uh, you know, we will get the information out as soon as it gets done. You know, it could take us a few months. Okay, uh, someone um, has say, a follow-up. Well, just a second. Um, I can say from the Ability Center's perspective, we've been invited to participate in the future planning um, committees as well. Um, and it's important to us to be able to get um, information out to our constituents. Um, so um, it sounds like there's a lot of interest about how this is going to develop and maybe some of the planning that's going to happen in the future. Um, and um, if anybody's interested in being kept up to date, um, you can also feel free to let us know um, and we can um, we can let you know about future webinars um, or um, about, you know, we can send out press releases to people who are interested or um, or we can find a way to make sure we're communicating as well. So um, if you are particularly interested in being connected, um, feel free to reach out to me too. The, uh, the follow-up was is they're asking if it was possible to get a copy and where they would find a copy of the, the current documents that have come out of the task force. Um, we have um, materials for all of our four ADA seminar webinars, including the finalized scarce allocation of resources document um, on our ADA seminar website. Um, and Katie Shelley, I just sent out a link to that in the chat. Um, so you would be able to access any of the materials, um, including that document um, on, on that website. All right, and I believe this is the last question we have time for. Um, this question, I'm not sure if this goes to anyone specifically, they didn't say so, but uh, it's, do you have anyone on your task force that specializes in accessibility and ensuring your communication modes are accessible to all? Again, I mean, Katie, I think that would be kind of you, I guess, in this situation, right? Um, yeah, I, I mean, so I would defer to Valerie for HCNO general, generally, because um, I'm not, I just don't have the details on that. Um, but I have been participating in these committees and um, trying to ensure that, you know, communications are accessible um, as they come out about this. Um, and, and I would say too, Katie, you're, you're being pretty gracious about it because we've asked you on our HMAC, we've been invited several times to other meetings so you could explain and make sure that the, that the disabled had a voice and that uh, things that we were doing and reports that we were doing um, met with what we needed to do to make sure that ageism, you know, ableism and racism were not a factor in anything that we were doing. So um, you were in the, in the ableism, you've been a, an, an invaluable help to us, not just on the task force, but you've also helped the HMAC committee and we just appreciate that. Um, thank they you. did clarify and they said the question was more about the general hospital settings and not about, um, I guess, the task force. So I guess they're asking more about accessibility and communication in general hospital settings. So 
So I don't know if anyone has an answer for that or not. If yeah, not, I think that would be more a hospital by hospital. I'll defer to the hospital people on that. Uh, we certainly have resources and um, deep awareness of needing to make information, every bit of information, I mean, informed consent needs to be accessible um, to people with all abilities. So it's something we deal with on a on a day to day basis um, regarding everything that we do. So um, do we do it perfectly? I suspect not. Um, you know, these are these are challenges, and um, if anyone ever has a moment of of us presenting information that is not perceived accessible, we need to know it. Um, but we that is a that is a primary um, priority for us in hospital based healthcare. And these were all great questions. Question. Is that what the last one, Jimmy? Anything else before we wrap up? All right, I would just um, say thanks again uh, to HCNO for being so, like I said, uh, you know, above in front of the curve on this issue um, and um, getting together such a wide uh, network of experts in multi, you know, disciplinary areas um, to give input and work on this. Um, some of the comments that were made about the collegial atmosphere, I think I made a comment to one of the doctors afterwards that as an attorney, I am not used to working in a collegial <laughs> atmosphere generally um, when I bring up ADA compliance, um, but, um, but that was not my experience here. Um, and I was very impressed by uh, the committee and um, everybody's priorities and goals um, and how quickly they worked on this and got everything together. Um, so congratulations again, you know, on receiving the Community Partnership Award. Um, I look forward to being involved in the future and it sounds like there's a lot of interest um, from folks who are on the, this webinar in being kept uh, informed um, about, you know, what's happening and what's on the horizon. So um, I hope that as the Ability Center, we're also able to help mediate that um, for folks who are interested. Um, you know, thanks for every thanks for everything, and uh, I guess I'll see you guys later. All right, and I just want to say thank you again to all of our panelists as well for joining us today. Um, and before everybody leaves, I just want to remind our attendees: um, feel free to check out the ADA seminar website. I did put the link in the chat. And if you indicated that you are attending these webinars for CLE credit, um, please make sure that you fill out the survey that pops up as you exit this webinar. You'll need to click yes to get the CLE code. Also make sure that you provide us with your bar number so that we can submit the proper documentation um, to the Ohio Supreme Court on our end. And we wanna thank everyone for their attendance at our fourth annual ADA seminar. We hope to see you next year. So thank you everybody and have a great day. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thanks Bye. a lot. Take care everybody. Bye. Bye.